In the morning, it was the morning, for a precious few seconds when Claire woke up, nothing was wrong, nothing at all. Her body hummed with energy, and the birds were singing outside, and the sun burnt in warm stripes across her bed. She squinted at the alarm clock, 7.30. Time to get up if she intended to make it her first class and still have any margin for coffee. It wasn't until she was in the shower and the hot water was pounding sense back into her head that she realised that all was not well. Her parents were in town. Her parents were on the radar screen of the monsters. And her parents wanted her to move back in with them. That put an end to her good mood. And by the time she padded down the steps, dragging her textbook loaded backpack and carrying her shoes, she was frowning. The house was a mess. Nobody had done the chores, including her. The kitchen was still a wreck, with breakfast congealing in the pans. She muttered to herself as a coffee brewed, dumped filthy dishes and pans into the sink to soak in hot water, and left a snarky note for her housemates, especially Shane, who'd slacked even more than was normal. Then she put on her shoes and walked to school. Mongerville looked just like any other dusty, sleepy town in the daylight. People out driving to work, jogging, pushing strollers, walking dogs. College students with backpacks as she got closer to the campus. The casual visitor never knew, at least during the daytime, that this place was so vastly screwed up. Claire supposed that was the point. She spotted some trucks delivering to local businesses. Did those drivers know? Did they just come and go without incident? Was there some off-limits rules for the vamps about whom they could hunt and whom they couldn't? They could have, they could have to be. Having the state police descend on Morganville wouldn't be helpful for the vampires. Hey. Claire blinked. A car was idling next to her, barely keeping pace as she walked. A red convertible, harsh and shiny as fresh blood in the sun. In it, three girls with identical false smiles. The driver, driver was Monica Morrell, the daughter of the town's mayor. Claire's worst human enemy from day one of her tenure in Morganville. Monica had mostly recovered from her recent brush with death by drugs, or at least she looked that way. Glossy as the car, and just as hard. Her blonde hair was shiny and casually styled. Her makeup perfect, and if she looked just a shade more pale than usual, it was hard to tell. Hey, Claire said, and made sure to drift farther over on the sidewalk, out of easy grabbing range. How are you feeling, Monica? Me? Great! Couldn't be better! Monica said brightly. There was something way darker in her eyes than in her tone. You tried to kill me, freak! Claire stopped dead in her tracks. No, she said. I didn't do that. You gave me that drug. It almost killed me. You took it from me! The red crystals. The ones that she'd stolen from Mernin. The ones that, however briefly, had seemed like a good idea. Not so much once she'd seen their effect on Monica and her own face in the mirror after taking them. They hadn't hurt her, but their effect on Monica had been shocking. Don't give me that. You nearly killed me, Monica said. I'd filed charges. With you being the founder's pet and all, that won't do any good. So we'll just have to find some other way to make sure you pay. Just wanted to give you the heads up, bitch. This isn't done. It isn't even started. It is on. She gave Claire a cold, hard smile and accelerated away with a screech of rubber on pavement. Claire shifted her backpack nervously and looked around. Nobody had paid attention, of course. It didn't pay in Morganville, to get into anybody else's business. She was on her own out here. Eve worked at campus, but Claire didn't want to drag her friends into this. They had enough problems already, and Monica was all her own, like it or not. But as she passed the recessed doorway of a boiled-up shop, she sensed someone watching her. She tried to dismiss it as imagination, but there really was someone watching her. She could make him out for a few seconds. Then she did with another unpleasant shock. Heroin addict Skinny... Pale, stringy hair. Wearing black. Eve's brother. Jason, she said. An involuntary looked around for help. Nobody there. Nobody she can turn to. Not even a passing police car. And the police definitely wanted to take, talk to Jason after his running with Shane. He did her again. He'd stabbed her boyfriend. Tried to kill him. The cop said it was self-defense, but she knew better. Jason took his hands out of his coat pockets and held them up. Don't scream, he said. Unless you really like it. I'm not going to hurt you. I'm in broad daylight on a busy street anyway. He sounded different. Odder than usual. And that was a pretty high standard of odd. What do you want? 
She clutched the strap of her backpack in a white knuckled fist. In an emergency, it would make a respectable blunt object. She might knock him down with it, or at least trip him. It was only about a block to common grounds. Oliver owned her protection once she was inside the building, even from human enemies. Stop freaking, genius. I mean, I'm not here to hurt you. He put his hands back in his jacket pockets. How Shane? Why do you care? Because he frowned and shrugged. Look, that was self-defense, okay? You baited him. You threatened me and Eve. You wanted him to come after you. Yeah? Well, granted, I was tweaking. But the guy took a home run swing at my head, in case you missed it. Uncomfortably, that was true. What about the other people you've killed? Were those all in self-defense too? Who says I've killed people? You did, remember? You left a dead girl in our basement for Shane to find. You tried to put him in prison. Jason didn't say a word to that. He just stared at her, and in the shadows, his, du- his dark eyes were like holes in his still, pale face. He looked dead. Dead than most vampires. I need to talk to my sister, he said. He doesn't want to talk to you, you psycho. Leave us alone. It's about our dad, he said. And even though Claire was walking away, leaving him and all his psycho problems behind, she slowed to turn back. I need to talk to Eve, to tell her I'll call. Tell her not to hang up. Claire nodded, once. She didn't hate him any less, but there was something different about him right now. Something that asked for a truce, but didn't get down on on its knees and beg for it either. No promises, she said. Jason on her back. Didn't expect any. He didn't say thanks. She just kept walking. When she looked back, the doorway was empty. She caught a glimpse of a black jacket turning the corner at the end of the block. Damn, he moves fast, she thought. And that gave her another kind of chill. What if Jason had gotten his wish? What if someone had made him a full-fledged vampire as hard as that seemed? She decided she'd ask Amelie, first chance she got. The morning classes came and went. It wasn't like any of them was especially difficult, even the high-level psych physics courses she tested herself into. She traded out some of her lame core classes for a mythology, mythology, mythology course. Or rather, Amelia had insisted on it. That was a fairly cool thing, and she found herself looking forward to it. No discussions of vampires just now, unfortunately. It was all about zombies, voodoo, and popular media on the subject. They were going to watch Night of the Living Dead next week. Claire didn't know nearly as much about zombies as most of the other students, except for the first-person shooter game that Shane liked to play. She couldn't remember ever really paying attention to the idea. Of course, since moving to Morganville, she wasn't ruling anything out was unlikely. After mythology, which turned out to be wealth of information, about voodoo. If she ever needed that. Claire had a break before lab sessions began. She took herself off to the university centre. It was a sprawling building, home to a large study area with long tables and groupings of chairs, and it featured a bookstore. A cafeteria that served fantastic grilled cheese sandwiches and salads at a pretty decent coffee bar. There wasn't a line today. Claire paid for a mocha and moved around to the barista side where Eve was working. Eve looked great today. Not just because of the care she'd taken with her outfit and makeup, she kind of radiated of satisfaction. Oh, right. Eve gave her an absolutely stunning smile and handed over a drink. Hey, bookworm. Doing okay? Sure. You? Not bad. It's even been kind of slow and steady today after the morning rush. That smile had a secret. So, how was your night? Claire prodded. The secret wanted to be shared, and besides, she was kind of... curious. Fantastic, Eve said. I just... yeah, since I was 14 I've had a crush on that boy, you know? And he never knew I existed. I went to every one of his concerts from the time he first started playing. Up at the last time he headlined at Common Grounds. I never thought. I just never thought it'd work out. And how was... Claire raised her eyebrows and left the question open to anything Eve wanted to make it mean. Eve's smile got wicked. Fantastic. They shared muffled squeals. Eve did a little happy dance behind the counter, dumped shots in a drink, and twirled. Claire never seen her look so full stop happy. Reality came back and she remembered why she'd come in the first place. She had the strong suspicion she was about to blow all the happiness sky high. Eve's smiling was fading, like someone had turned down her dinner switch. Claire, you're wearing your worried face. What's wrong? 
I... Claire hesitated, then plunged in. I saw Jason this morning. Eve's dark eyes widened, but she didn't say anything. She waited. He wants me to tell you that he's going to call. Something about your dad, he says. He says not to hang up. My dad? He repeated. You're sure? That's what he said. I told him no promises. Claire sipped her mocha, which was perfect, and watched Eve's expression. Not too easy to read right now. He didn't try to hurt me. Broad daylight on the main street? Yeah, well, he's bug out crazy, but he's not stupid. He seemed very far away suddenly. Eve seemed very far away suddenly. And all the happy glow was gone. I haven't talked to either one of my parents since my 18th birthday. Why not? They tried to sell me to Brandon. She said flatly. Like a piece of meat on the hoof. I don't know why Jason's suddenly all nostalgic about the fam. It's not like they were good times to remember. But they're still your parents. Yeah, unfortunately. Look, here's the story of the Rossa clan. We're the original nuclear family, as in nuclear bomb. Toxic even when it doesn't explode. Eve shook her head. Whatever dad's damage is, I don't care. And I don't know why Jason would either. Another student had paid for coffee, and Eve cast him an absent, empty smile and started pulling espresso shots with a mechanical precision. It's nothing, she said. I'm hanging up on him when he calls, if he calls. And even if it's something, I don't give a damn anyway. Kledge nodded. She had no idea what to say. Eve was clearly upset. A lot more upset than she'd expected her to be. She waved goodbye and took herself off to a nearby study table and began plowing through a book she'd borrowed from the library. Somebody's PhD paper, which read like the, the guy had never bothered to attend a single English composition class. Good equations, though. She was heavily involved in them when her cell phone rang. Hello? She didn't recognise the number, but it was local, and not her parents. Claire Danvers? Yeah? Who's this? My name's Dr. Robert Mills, and I'm the one who treated your friend Shane in the hospital. She felt a piercing sensation of alarm. Nothing's wrong with... No, nothing like that. He broke in instantly. Look, you were the one who had the red crystals, right? The ones that nearly killed the mayor's daughter. Claire's momentary relief burnt away like flash paper. I guess, she said. I gave them to the doctor. Well, here's the thing. I've been looking at those, clo those crystals. Where'd you get them? I found them. Technically true. Where? In a lab. I need you to show me this lab, Claire. I don't think I can do that. I'm sorry. Look, I understand that you're probably protecting someone. Someone important. But if it helps, I already have approval from the council to work on these crystals. And I really need more information about them. Who developed them. How the ingredients... I think I can help. Amelie was on the Elders' Council. But she hadn't said anything about working with the Doctor. And let me find out what I can tell you, Claire said. I'm sorry, I'll call back. Soon, he said. I've been told the goal is to increase the effectiveness of this drug by at least 50% within the next couple of months. Claire blinked. Do you know what it does? Dr. Mills, who sounded pleasant and normal, laughed. Do I really know? Probably not. This is Morganville. We invented the concept of the secret around here, but I have a pretty decent idea that whatever it is, it's not designed for human consumption. That was as much as Claire wanted to talk about on the phone. No matter how friendly he seemed. After a quick excuse, she hung up and called Amelie. She intended to leave a message, and that she thought would probably be the end of it. Amelie picked up the call. Claire stammered, took a deep breath, and told her about Dr. Mills and his request. I should have told you last evening. I have decided to concede to your request to have additional resources on this project, Amelia said. Dr. Mills is a trusted expert, a long-time resident of the town, and he won't make the kind of value judgments others might. He's also capable of keeping our secrets, and that is imperative. You understand why? Claire did, all too well. The crystals were a drug that helped vampires ward off the effects of a degenerative disease, a disease they all had. One that was robbing them of their ability to reproduce. Amelia was the strongest, but she was sick too. And the worst cases were insane, or locked away in cells beneath Morganville. And so far, few of the vampires knew about the illness. Once they did, there might not be nothing to stop them from lashing out. Blaming others. Innocent humans, probably. 
just as bad it would be the effects of the human population. Once they knew the vampires weren't invincible, how many of them would really cooperate? Emily had long ago figured that this could destroy Morganville, and Claire was pretty sure she was right. But he wants to see Mernin's lab, Claire, Claire said. Mernin, her mentor and sometimes even her friend, had slipped off the edge of sanity, and he was in one of the cells. Lucid sometimes, and other times, dangerously not. Should I take him there? No. Tell him that you'll bring what he needs to the hospital. I don't want any human other than yourself in that lab, Claire. They are secrets that must be kept, and I rely on you to see it. See to it. Restrict his research only by refining and enhancing the form you have already created. What Amelia meant is that, in what Amelia meant, in that queen cool way, was that if Claire spilt the beans, she'd end up dead. Or worse. Yes, Claire said faintly. I understand. About my parents? They are safe enough, Amelia said. That wasn't the same thing as saying they were safe. You'll not see Mr. Bishop for the time being. If you happen to see his two associates, be polite, but don't fear. They are well in hand. Maybe by Amelia's standards. I was a little bit much worried. A little bit more worried. Okay, she said doubtfully. If anything happens, discover with Oliver... Amelia said. Curiously, I find the difference between us lessened dramatically once my sire paid a visit. Nothing like a common enemy to un unite squabbling neighbours. She paused for a moment, then said some almost awkwardly, You and your friends, you're all well? We're doing small talk now? Claire shivered. Yeah, we're fine. Thank you. Good. Amelia hung up. Claire mouthed a silent okay and pocketed the phone. As she was leaving, she saw Eve at the barista station. Staring blankly at the levers as she worked. The happy glow hadn't returned. In fact, she looked grim and scared. Damn it! Why did I ruin her day like that? She have just blown him off, the little psycho. Claire checked her watch, snagged her backpack, and jogged off to her lab class. When she met Dr. Mills later that afternoon, she did it at the hospital, in his office. He was a medium sort of guy, medium tall, medium age, medium colouring. He had a nice smile, which seemed to promise that everything would be okay. And despite the fact that Claire knew it was total fiction, she smiled back. Have a seat, Claire, he said, and indicated one of the blue club chairs in front of his desk. Behind him were floor-to-ceiling bookshelves, medical references in matching bindings, with some fewer off-brand volumes thrown in for variety. Dr. Mills had stacks of magazines and photocopied articles on one corner of the desk, and a teetering set of patient files on the other. A framed photo faced away from Claire, so she couldn't see if it had family. He had a wedding ring, though. Dr. Mills didn't speak immediately. He leant back in his leather chair, steeped in his, his fingers, st step steepled? steepled his fingers and looked at her for a while. She fought against the urge to squirm, but couldn't keep her fingers from restlessly picking at the fabric of her jeans. I knew you were young, she said finally. He said finally. But I admit I'm even more surprised now. You're 16? 17 in a few weeks, Claire said. She was getting resigned to having this conversation with every single other in Morgville. She wanted to just record it and play it back every time she met somebody new. Well, from the notes that immediately has provided to me, you have a very solid grasp of what you're doing. I don't think it'll be. I'll be much... I don't think I'll be so much directing your research as helping you execute your experiments. Where I see opportunities to add some value, I will. Obviously, the labs here at the hospital have much more sophisticated equipment than I imagine that imagine you have, wherever you would develop your initial crystals. He flipped through the large folder open in the centre of his desk, and Claire saw photocopies of her own neat handwriting, her notes, which she provided to Amelie. I took liberty of making up a set of crystals based on your formula. Using the facilities in our lab, I found that if you accelerate the drying process with heat, you can increase the strength of the dosage by about 20%. But I also created a stronger liquid version that can be delivered directly into the body by injection. She blinked. Injection? She had to imagine getting close enough to Mern to stick a needle in his arm, especially when he was on one of his bad swings. It can be delivered through a dart, like an animal tranquilizer. Although I wouldn't use that analogy to anyone else. Wouldn't be respectful. 
She managed to smile. That'd be very helpful. I didn't try the heating process for drying the crystals. That's interesting. No reason you should have. I tried it because I didn't have an unlimited time to dry them. Our lab's busy, and I didn't want anyone questioning what I was doing. I've asked Emilia to provide us with some more secure laboratory space in the university. More convenient for you, and safer for me. I can have equipment move there as we need it, or requisition it through the council. Dr. Mills co cocked his head and looked at her again, brown, brown eyes bright and challenging. Like Mernin's only not half as crazy. About my request to your lab where you made the crystals. Sorry, I can't. Perhaps you reach it with Amelie. He sighed. I did. No, sorry. I did. He sighed. Then when can I examine our patient? You don't. Claire, this will not work if I can't take baseline readings of the on the patient and determine what the measurable improvements are as we change the formula. She did see that, actually, but the thought of putting nice Dr. Mills in grabbing distance of Mernin made her shiver. I'll check. She promised and got to her feet. I'm sorry, it's getting late. I need to... Dr. Mills glanced at his office window. Outside the blinds, the sky was darkening from faded denim to indigo. Of course, I understand. Here's a sample of the new batch of crystals, but before you give it to him... See if you can get baseline information. Most importantly, a blood sample. A blood sample, she repeated. He opened a drawer and handed her a small, sealed kit. It had a syringe, gauze pads, alcohol wipes, and a couple of vacuum tubes. You're not serious. I'm not saying it might not be, be difficult, but if you won't let me go with you to do it... She could do a lot of things. But she was pretty sure she couldn't hold Mernin down and stick a needle in his vein. Not likely he was altered. She took the kit and put it in a backpack. Anything else? Dr. Mills passed her a gun. A dark gun. He opened the back to show her the fluffy end of the tube. It's preloaded with one dose, he said. I only have made a, I've only made up a few. It takes some time to distill. Here are two extra if you need them. As she stowed the gun in her backpack, she said... It's untested, so be careful. I think it will be stronger and longer lasting, but I'm not sure about the side effects. And the crystals? He passed them over too. They looked a little finer than the ones she developed, more like raw sugar. Those weren't went into the back to back pack as well. Claire, he said, as she hoistened the burden. Have you heard any rumors about a new vampire in town? She froze. A gold bracelet, the one with Amelie's symbol attached on it, caught the light and glittered, not that she needed the reminder. Just Michael, she said. But that's not news. I heard there were strangers. Claire shrugged. Guess she heard wrong. She left before she if she had to lie anymore. She couldn't stop herself from glancing back at him. He nodded and smiled a goodbye. She felt bad, but there was only so much truth she was prepared to give, even to somebody who came recommended by Amelie. Did you bring the hamburger? Claire didn't even have time to drop her backpack in the hallway floor at home before Eve had buzzed her in like a dark, caffeine fueled Tinkerbell, brandishing a wooden spoon. Uh, what? Hamburger. I sent you a text. Oops. Claire dug her phone out and saw that, sure enough, there was a flashing message icon. Didn't get it. Sorry. Crap! Eve turned away and marched down back the hall. Doc Martin's boots clomping with fine disregarded fine disregard for the safety of the wooden floor michael guess what you're running errands michael was playing guitar something fast and complicated he stopped periodically which was unusual for him and he ignored eve which wasn't normal either as claire rounded the corner she saw him standing up at the dinner table leaning over to jot down music on a lined page to know that he wasn't ignoring eve so much as not obeying i'm busy he said she frowned at the paper and played the same phrase again, then again. Shook his head in frustration, erased the notes on the paper. You and Shane go. I'm cooking! He rolled her eyes. Creative people. They think the world stops when they think. I'll go, Claire said. The chance to be alone with Shane, even on something as boring as a trip to the all-night grocery, was too good to miss. But if I do anyway, I got the free pass. She held the bracelet. Michael pulled himself away from the music in his head long enough to give... 
pulled away from the music in his head long enough to give her a look. He tapped his pencil on a fast, complicated rhythm on the table. 30 minutes, he said. There and back. No excuses. If you guys are late, I'm a coming after you. And I'm going to be pissed off. Thanks, Dad. She wished she hadn't said it. Not so much because of the grimace on Michael's face, but because it made her think of her actual dad. And that clock was running on how long he'd allow her to continue her current living arrangements. She came out of the kitchen sucking on his fingertips. What's going on? You have not been sticking your dirty fingers in my sauce, Eve said, and pointed her wooden spoon at him. He quickly took the finger out of his mouth. First off, they're not dirty. I'd lick them first. And second, did I hear something about the store? Claire? Yeah, I'm ready. He grabbed Eve's keys from the table. Then let's roll. Shane was a good driver, and he knew Morgaville at the back of his hand. Of course, Morgaville was just about that big too. And there was only one all-night grocery store. The Food King. Locally owned and operated. The parking lot was lit up like a football stadium. There were 15 or so cars already there, evenly split between human vehicles and vampmobiles. Shane parked directly under a blazing set of lights and turned off the car. Wait, he said as Claire reached for the door handle. It takes about five minutes to get there. Five minutes to get the stuff, five minutes back home. That gives us a whole 15 minutes. She felt her heart stammer and race a little faster. Shane was looking at her with fierce intensity. So what do you want to do? She asked, trying to sound casual about it. I want to talk, he said, which was not what she expected. Not at all. I can't talk about this back at the house. I never knew who could be listening. Meaning Michael? Shane shrugged. It's just never exactly private. He wasn't wrong. But she still felt horribly disappointed. Sure, she said, and knew she sounded stiff and wounded. Go ahead, talk. Her eyes widened. You thought, just talk, Shane. He cleared his throat. <clears throat> I've been doing some research on Bishop. The idea of Shane and research didn't seem to want to fall into the same sentence. Where? The town library. He shrugged. Special collections. I know Janice, librarian. She was a friend of my mum's. She let me into the back and take a look at some of the older stuff. The things they don't put out for public reading. The vampire collection. He nodded. Anyway, the only thing I could find out was a reference to a bishop. Maybe not the same one who killed a lot of people about 500 years ago. Doesn't sound too unusual. Except that he wasn't killing humans, Shane said. From the way the thing was written, Bishop was killing off his enemies in the vampire community, making himself the ruler of the world. And then something happened, and he dropped out of sight. Wow. No wonder Amelia and Oliver were freaked. If he's been underground all this time, and has a rep for taking out anyone who stands in his way, she wonder vampire. Yeah, I'd be freaked too. Anyway, I thought you should know. It could be important. Thanks. He nodded, gaze fixed on hers. Anything else? She prompted. Yeah. He leant forward and kissed her. His weight settled toward her, leaning her back against the door, and she felt all the strength and breath go out of her body, replaced with a quivering, golden vibration. Oh. Shane's lips were warm and damp, soft but demanding, and she heard herself make a sound like a whimper in response. His hands knew just where to hold her. One at the back of her head, one at the small of her back, pulling her closer, fitting their bodies together. It felt so good. It was like swimming in sunlight, her fingers tangled in his soft, shaggy hair and traced down his back. And for a wild second, she imagined what it would be like, right here, right now, in his big car. It seemed to go on forever, a dreamy eternity of heat. His hands slipped down her shoulders, traced her collarbone, and then moved lower. She heard herself make a sound that was more of a whine than anything else, a naked plea. As the heat of his touch reached the top of her bra, slid past the edge and down. Shane broke the kiss with a gasp, leaning his cheek against hers. The sound of his breath in her ear made her shiver again. So close. God, was so close. We'd better go inside, he said. It sounded like he was fighting hard to sound normal, but he was missing by a mile. And when he sat back, all she could see was the hot focus in his eyes and his damp, reddened, totally kissable lips. She wondered what he was seeing in her and realised with a shock that it was probably the same thing. 
shared hunger. Yeah, she said. She didn't sound normal either. She wasn't sure she could walk, in fact. Her whole body felt like it had melted, especially around the knees. She took in a couple of deep breaths, and then stopped when Shane's eyes focused on the rise and fall of her chest. We should go shop. Shane checked his watch. No. We should get the hamburger, throw money at the cashier, and break every speed limit back to the house if we don't want Michael calling up a SWAT team. That sobered them up, enough to get them out of the car and into the store. They had, but they held hands the whole way. Inside, the place looked too bright, and yet somehow too cold. Aisles of colourful packages. There were a few shoppers pushing carts, and some of them, Claire knew, had to be vampires. But she couldn't necessarily tell which ones. At a glance, many of them had perfected their human disguises. Was it the 20-something girl with the red hair and the long shopping list? Or the elder lady with a little fluffy dog riding in the child seat of the cart? Not the dad with the two small children on the harassed look. She's sure not he she was sure of that one. Claire didn't really have time to gawk. Shane let go of her hand and pointed off down one aisle. She split off toward the meat section, choosing hamburger was mainly a decision about poundage, and Eve hadn't said how much to get. Claire settled for two packages, and headed for the aisle where Shane had disappeared. The snack aisle. What a shock. The song on the store speakers changed to an annoying and slightly creepy song from the 1970s. I always feel like somebody's watching me. It's probably from the 70s. Something about the seasons and the sun. Never mind. <laughs> and she was thinking about how ironic that was when she rounded the end cap display and found Shane backed up against the shelves, with a woman pressed right up against him. It was a female vamp Bishop had brought to town. She was wearing a tight-fitting pair of blue jeans, a form-fitting maroon knit, knit shirt and a black leather jacket. Black ankle boots with buckles. Feminine, but dangerous. Her dark hair flowed over her shoulders in luxurious, glossy waves. And her skin was the colour of fine porcelain. A tiny bit of blush in her cheeks. Her eyes were fixed on chains. He was crushing a bag of chips in one hand. But he clearly forgotten all about it. The vampire leant forward and took in a deep breath from around Shane's neck. Shane closed his eyes and didn't move. Mm, she said in that slow, sweet voice. You smell like desire. I can feel it curling off your skin. Poor little thing. All frustrated and wanting. I could help you with that. Shane didn't open his eyes. Get away from me. The vampire's hand shot out to slam hard against the shelves next to Shane's head. The entire structure rocked unsteadily, but didn't quite go over. Don't be rude, Shane Collins. Yes, I know who you are. You've been locking us up, so I did a little reading all on my own. You've got daddy problems, don't you? I understand. I have those too. I could tell you all about it if you come with me. Be nice to have a strong man to tell my troubles to. As quickly as it had to come, her anger was gone and she was back to the vampire sex kit and she'd been back at the glass houses, running her pale fingers down Shane's collarbone over his chest. I said, go away. Shane said and opened his eyes to stare at her face. Not interested, Leech. Um, my name's Sandra, honey. Not Leech, bitch or bloodsucker. And if you want to survive my visit to the cess this cesspool of a town, you'll learn to call me by my name, Shane. Her pale lips curled into a smile. Or well, she want other people to survive it. Now let's be friends. She leant forward and brushed her lips lightly against Shane's, and Claire saw him shudder and go completely still. Sandra laughed, reached past him and plucked a bag of baked chips from the rack. Mmm, she said. Salty. To the other girlfriend, I like the taste of her lip gloss. Shane walked away. Shane and Claire stayed frozen where they were until she was out of sight, and then Claire rushed to him. When she put her head on him, he flinched. Just a little. Don't touch me, he said. His voice was hoarse, and the vein in his throat was beating very, very fast. I don't want... Shane, it's me. It's Claire. He reached out for her then, like a drowning man clutching a life raft, and his strength shocked her as he pulled her in, his head bent as she felt the weight of it resting on her shoulder, the feverish, damp heat of his forehead against her neck. She felt the shudder go through him, just one, just enough to tell her how horribly wrong he felt. 
God, she whispered, and gently stroked his hair. It was wet underneath, matted with sweat. What did she do to you? <clears throat> he shook his head without raising it from her shoulder. He couldn't, or wouldn't, say it. His chest rose and fell, taking in breaths that felt like gasps, but were too deep for that. And after what seemed like a full minute, Shane's body began to relax, uncoiling from the awful tension. When he pulled back, she expected to get a look of his expression, but he turned away so fast it was just a blur. Wounded dark eyes and a stark pale mask. He looked down at the chips he was holding and dropped them on the floor as he walked away. Claire quickly put them back on the shelf and followed. He kept going, right past the registers. She called out cash to the impatient cashier for the hamburger, grabbed the plastic bag and hurried out into the lamplight darkness after her boyfriend. He was already unlocking the car and getting in. She was still at least a dozen feet away when he started the car with a roar. She saw the flare of brake lights as he shifted into gear. For a heart-stopping moment, second, Claire thought he was going to peel out and drive away, leaving her there in the dark, but he waited. She opened the passenger door and got in. Shane didn't move. Are you okay? She asked. He didn't so much as look at her. He put the car in gear and burnt rubber on the way out of the lot. Hello, everyone. Thank you for listening to the um, the audio file or audio reading I've done of a Rachel Kane book. Um, I'm putting this in there, so if you want to skip past this bit and move on to the next video, that's fine by me. This is just like a cancer plug because... I want to do this as well as also I have to do this because the thing you've just listened to is illegal for me to do without having a charity case behind it, which I feel I don't want it to be like a situation like, oh, I'm only doing this for the sake of cancer, which I'm actually doing this for the sake of cancer, but I did cancel this series a long, long time ago. It came to my recent attention that I should redo this in a better format, and I feel like now is a perfect opportunity to actually restart this in the worst possible way. Back in in 1st of November back in 2020, Rachel Kane sadly passed away to a rare bone cancer called sarcoma. Now, in the description below is going to be a link that you can... It's going to be a link so you can support the um, research into helping people survive and defeat sarcoma bone cancer and soft tissue cancer cells and all that stuff. So that's just going to be in the description right there down below. It is in pounds for those American ones, but obviously PayPal and all the research still goes to the same thing because once it's being cured... Once they found a cure for it or found an easier solution for it and stuff like that, it does get sent around all around the world because everyone works on the same thing all over the world. It's just that this charity is based in UK. I live in the UK, so it still goes to the same goal to beat sarcoma for a long time. And I feel like this is the best opportunity to work with it for any Rachel King books that we do during the Morganville series or any future series that we do. Obviously, this is even going to be in the future series if we do do them. So, any book that we do by Rachel Kane is going to have this at the end, just to plug a little bit of a cancer support for people with sarcoma, because it is a rare, rare cancer, and there is not a very good survival rate. So, just putting that in there to help people or to support the issues that are out there, because I'm not going to get any money from these videos at all, even in like the present one. I'm not getting any money of this recording or in the future, if possibly I do. But this is not what I'm about. This is all about for for what Rachel Cain succumbed to in the end. So hopefully that as a team, together, we can beat sarcoma and end one of the cancers that are killing people. Because no one likes that. But anyway, have a good day.